As the race for obesity drugs and weight loss treatments heat up, Eli Lilly has acquired Versanis. That is a nearly $2 billion deal. It gives Lilly access to the drug maker's weight loss treatment by Magrumab. Joining us right now with more on this is Dr. Scott Gottlieb, who is former FDA commissioner and a CNBC contributor who also serves on the boards of both Pfizer and Illumina. And Dr. Gottlieb, it seems like everybody has a weight loss drug these days. How is this one different? Yeah, look, there's a lot of activity in this space. I think the attractive feature here for Lilly is that this could potentially be used in combination with the GLP-1 uh, drugs that we're seeing right now, drugs like Monjoro or Zempic that people are using for weight loss, and could potentially allow you to lower the dose of those drugs. Um, this drug works by binding to a completely different receptor. It was initially developed by Novartis, actually, to try to forestall physiological muscle loss in certain muscle-wasting diseases. And what they noticed was that it helped build back muscle but it also helped promote weight loss. And so the concern around the GLP-1 drugs right now is that patients lose weight when they're taking those drugs. They lose fat, but they also lose some lean muscle. And so the, the belief is that potentially if you could use this drug in combination with those GLP-1 drugs, it might be, a lot, might be able to lower the dose of the GLP-1 drugs, but you also could potentiate weight loss without having the uh, side effects of some muscle loss along with that. And in fact, it's being tested in a phase two study right now, this new drug, um, to look at its use in combination with those GLP-1 uh, GLP drugs. But then you could dial back how much of the Azempic or one of the other drugs you're using, and that would be good news because we don't know all of the potential side effects of those drugs yet? Yeah, that's right. Look, these, um, these drugs are being used in very high doses for weight loss, probably four to five times the doses that they've traditionally been used in uh, type 2 diabetes. So we have a lot of history with these drugs. So we have a large safety database. But that safety database is the use of these drugs at lower doses. They haven't been used at these very high doses for as long of a period of time. And so you're going to probably unmask more of the side effects associated with these drugs. You already see that in terms of the tolerability. At the higher doses, they're less tolerable. You need to titrate patients on them more slowly. So this drug right now is delivered once a month through an IV formulation. So I think the belief is that if you could deliver this drug once a month, potentially sub-Q eventually, subcutaneously, in conjunction with these GLP-1 drugs, you not only could potentiate more weight loss um, and forestall some of the skeletal muscle loss, lean muscle loss that you see with the GLP-1 drugs with prolonged use, potential, but potentially could lower the dose as well. And so you could use a combination of a low dose of this new drug with the GLP-1, and that could allow you to get more weight loss, more benefits with fewer side effects. I think that's probably part of the thinking here. I think there's a lot of opportunities for Lilly, and it seems to be an attractive uh, investment for them. So I'm still trying to get my, uh, my head around the actual mechanism of, of what you're talking about, the Ozempics uh, and such, because of the, that report on uh, suicidal thoughts. It, does it, so it, you don't feel hungry anymore. So it's, it, its mechanism is actually in, on the, in the CNS, the central nervous system. So there, is there some neurotransmitter that it's, uh, that it's affecting? Does, does that, can you connect the dots to why you'd have these psychological side effects or does it work as you said just on muscles and uh, where's the where is it the mechanism of action for ozempic in the brain yeah we don't fully understand but probably well, oh, centrally great. and peripherally we're, we're so it acts 10 times it, the normal it, it, to, to lose weight we're taking 10 times the normal doses for what is used for something really important and we have no idea what the mechanism is well, it's believed to act on dopamine reward systems oh, inside great. the brain. So that's the dopamine. central mechanism. It also acts so peripherally on, neuro on neurotransmitters in the intestine. And that's what leads to the feeling of early fullness, early satiety, and slows gastric emptying. So that's the local effect. So there is a central effect and a lo local effect. I don't think we fully understand yeah. the central effect, but it is believed to act on dopamine reward pathways. And that could be potentially the root through which it's affecting behavior if, in fact, that effect is real. And I know the EU is looking into that right now. Yeah, the suicidal part. Because dopamine is, is what makes you feel happy sometimes, right? Or, or it's a pleasure, the newer trend. And if you're not getting that. If you're not getting <laughs> it, yeah. Well, it's, I can understand. Right, that's, that's why there's... That's why there's speculation that this could be used um, in other settings to try to reduce sort of Happiness? addictive type of behaviors, <laughs> impulsive behaviors. There's some, some speculation around that. Okay. Dr. Gottlieb, let me shift the conversation. The World Health Organization recently classified um, aspartame 
as something that could be a possible carcinogen. And obviously, it's a soda sweetener. It's used in things like Diet Coke and Diet Pepsi. And this comes just a couple of months after we heard that another artificial sweetener, Splenda sucralose, could cause or does cause DNA damage. You just wonder, is there anything that people should be doing with any of these artificial sweeteners? Or would you just tell people to drink regular sugar, but in modified and limited doses? Now, look, I would tell people to use these artificial uh, sugars appropriately. I think the World Health Organization's own statement was you had to drink above 14 cans of Diet Coke a day to potentially see um, some increased risk. And there were two World Health Organization bodies with conflicting recommendations, one saying it wasn't a carcinogen, the other saying it was potentially a carcinogen, very speculative research on their part. I don't have concerns here. We've looked at this very closely when I was at the FDA. The FDA has looked at it very closely since. There's been exhaustive studies here that haven't demonstrated a risk. And look, these, do, these sweeteners do help reduce obesity. They help reduce diabetes. They're very important for diabetics who want to have um, sweet products, want to have diet, diet sodas and other sweet products, but can't have the ill effects of what, sugar. What, so these are important sucralose? ingredients. They need to be what used in moderation. What about with the DNA damage? Would you say the same thing that you would for aspartame? I would say the same. I would say the same thing. Um, that's been looked at very exhaustively. Some of the largest studies and epidemiological studies have looked at these artificial sweeteners. And look, saccharin's been around for a long yeah, time as well. Saccharin, and there was yeah. a determination made many determination made many years ago that that was a carcinogen and they retracted yeah. it. Retracted so I think, I I think we have a very large body of evidence with these uh, ingredients.